I'm from the Department of Dermatology and Venerology at Comenius University Medical School in Bratislava, Slovakia. And I'm in the position of assistant lecturer and researcher. Uh, today, I'll be talking to you about the immunogenicity of infliximab about measuring the trap levels of infliximab and antibodies to infliximab. And most importantly, I would like to share with you our practical patient management according to uh, infliximab levels and antibodies to infliximab. Well, biologicals are the top anti-seratic treatment that we can offer uh, to our patients. They are, uh, uh, they are uh, highly efficacious and relatively safe. In my country, uh, we use four biologicals that are officially approved for the treatment of psoriasis. Uh, during clinical trials, uh, antibodies to biological uh, drugs uh, were detected, and the human body produces antibodies to biological drugs due to their foreignity, their molecular size, their structure, and the individual genetic disposition uh, uh, of a person. Biologicals are big molecules. Their uh, molecular weight ranges from 18,000 uh, up to 145,000 Daltons uh, compared to the molecular weight of the small molecules, for example. Their structure is complex uh, spatial. In recent years, uh, immunogenicity of uh, biologicals uh, has been the hottest topic. However, in common clinical practice, the drug levels of biologicals and the, and the antibodies are not uh, commonly measured. As you can see from uh, this table, only the antibodies to etanercept are not neutralizing, and therefore these antibodies are not responsible for secondary loss of treatment efficacy and for treatment safety. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, the immunogenicity of infliximab, and antibodies to infliximab are neutralizing, so they are responsible for uh, secondary loss of treatment efficacy, as well as for, uh, for infusion reactions, especially hypertensive infusion reactions. My team and I uh, have been monitoring the trough levels of infliximab and antibodies to infliximab since uh, August 2012. And this uh, monitoring helps us and our patients on infliximab to stay on the safe side with this fastest acting biological. Uh, let's move to the second part uh, of my talk. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about the trough levels of infliximab and antibodies to infliximab. As you all probably know, infliximab is a TNF-alpha blocker. It is a chimeric antibody against free soluble as well as membrane-bound TNF-alpha. Uh, the standard dosing for psoriasis is 5 milligrams per kilogram uh, administered IV. Uh, the advantages of this treatment are the very well designed induction phase of treatment week 0, 2 and 6, uh, continued by the maintenance phase every 8 weeks. The advantages of infliximab are the weight based dosing um, and the, uh, the dose can even be doubled up to 10 milligrams per kilogram, but that's more of an issue for gastroenterology. Uh, that's the dosing they use for inflammatory bowel diseases. Another advantage of infliximab is the possibility of shortening the maintenance interval to six or even down to four weeks. And infliximab has a good effect on joints. Patients usually uh, report uh, joint symptoms improvement already after uh, two infusions of uh, infliximab. Um, regarding uh, efficacy, um, infliximab um, uh, is uh, m more than 80% of patients uh, achieve PASI 75 after 12 weeks of uh, therapy. However, we think that uh, achieving PASI 90 in a good responder uh, should be uh, the cutoff for 12-week uh, therapy with a biological treatment. Antibodies to uh, infliximab are uh, reported both from clinical trials as well as from uh, clinical practice. As you can see, the uh, numbers vary and uh, this difference may be due to different methods of how we can detect antibodies and different diagnostic kits that are used between the different uh, study groups. Uh, antibodies to infliximab are neutralizing, so again, they are responsible for loss of treatment efficacy and for uh, infusion reactions. Uh, how, how can we detect antibodies? We can either use ELISA or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. This method is cheaper. There are false positive results, uh, which uh, we have to uh, 
know how to distinguish. This can be due to other immunoglobulins, such as rheumatoid factor, which is an immunoglobulin M. Um, and uh, uh, the most important thing for ELISA is to keep in mind that it does not capture IgG4. So the antibodies that we measure with ELISA are IgG1. And uh, IgG4, they should not even be responsible for allergic reactions. They may be responsible for loss of treatment efficacy, but this is still a questionable uh, field. Another method how we can detect antibodies is a radioimmunoassay. This is a more expensive method. There is radioactivity to it, should be more precise. And there are also possible false uh, positive uh, results uh, um, reported. Uh, let's move on to uh, our practical patient management at our department. So since August 2012, we measure uh, the drug levels and anti-infliximab antibodies uh, in the serum. Uh, we use ELISA and the diagnostic kits that we have are Matrix Biotech from Ankara Laboratories, Turkey. Uh, this is a protocol that we have created according uh, to our uh, experience. So we are looking at the drug levels and the levels of antibodies in week two, in week six, 14, and 22, because this is the highest probability when we can have infusion reactions because it takes six weeks for IgGs to uh, synthesize. So week six, week 14, week 22, these are the uh, most kind of dangerous weeks for, uh, for infusion reactions. Um, but apart from this, whenever we see a clinical uh, loss of response in the patient or an infusion reactions, we always measure uh, infliximab levels and antibodies to infliximab even apart uh, from this protocol. Um, and how did we uh, come, come up uh, to this uh, protocol? Well, we have been looking at dynamics of infliximab levels. Um, during um, one maintenance period, we were uh, examining them in week zero, in week two, four, six, seven, and eight of a maintenance interval. According to this, we were able to create uh, a curve of the drug levels. And according th to the dynamics of infliximab levels and the presence or absence of antibodies to infliximab in the patient, we were able to create four uh, different patient groups. I'm going to guide you through this. And each group of, uh, of these patients has a proposed therapeutic uh, management, uh, which we've been following for a period of more than uh, one year. So these are the four groups of patients. So you can either have responders, you can eat or you can have responders with shortened period of efficacy, or you can have non-responder to infliximab with production of antibodies and non-responders without production of antibodies. So the first group are uh, responders. Responders uh, have a good clinical efficacy. So after the infusion of infliximab uh, in, week, uh, in week zero, uh, the trough levels of, of the drug are never zero. They're usually between one and two. And this is the same situation in week eight. So at the end of the maintenance interval, these patients still have sufficient drug levels. So they are clinically doing well. Uh, in week two, we see something uh, we call the infliximab peak because that's when the drug level is the highest. And these patients have really high infliximab peaks in week two. And then we see the gradual decrease from week two until week eight. And these patients do not produce antibodies to infliximab. So this treatment is safe for them. And our recommendation is to continue with the treatment without changes. The second group of patients are responders with shortened period of efficacy. So uh, we're looking at patients who are doing uh, clinically well after the infusion of infliximab, but in the last uh, weeks, usually in week seven and eight, they start to lose, uh, lose efficacy, uh, the formation of new lesions starts, or uh, there is a worsening of the existing lesions. And uh, for this group of patient, it is patients, it is characteristic that their trough or the residual levels of the drug in week zero and eight are usually around zero, up to 0 0.5, and their uh, infliximab peak in week two is very low. These patients, however, do not produce antibodies to infliximab. So our question is, and also question for discussion, because these are all, uh, these are our personal opinions, and I would be more than glad to uh, discuss this question. What is the cause of the very low infliximab peak in week two in this group of patients? Uh, we were thinking about uh, that there may be an insufficient dose uh, according to body weight 
this may be the situation in uh, the so-called borderline body weight patients when they benefit from adding one more vial of infliximab. Like let's say a patient has 97 kilograms, they have five vials of infliximab, but you add one more and they're clinically doing better. Um, or the patient may have a faster metabolism of the drug. Uh, we do know that infliximab is being degraded through unspecific proteases. It is eliminated through immunocomplexes, through a reticular endothelial system. But what kind of immunocomplexes do we have in these patients? Because objectively, we know that they do not produce antibodies to infliximab. So what is the antibody within the immune complex? Maybe uh, it is um, the antibody that we cannot detect uh, with, uh, with uh, ELISA. But this is also a question. The third answer to this question uh, may be the genetic increase in TNF-alpha production, uh, because we all know the uh, well-known TNF2 polymorphism in the position of minus 308 in the uh, promoter region of the gene. And these patients have a, a multiple, um, multiple uh, they have an elevated um, production of, uh, of TNF-alpha due to, these, uh, due to this uh, polymorphism. Uh, the fourth reason that we uh, have thought about might be uh, an acquired increase in TNF-alpha production due to cytokine booster from abdominal type of obesity. Uh, because we all have patients like this, these are examples of our patients uh, with abdominal type of obesity, and this adipose tissue um, produces adipokines, as we all know. We are looking at certain adipokine levels, and also e we are checking E-selectin, which is a vascular adhesion molecule. But so far, we have not uh, seen any serious uh, correlation uh, uh, with uh, TNF-alpha production and uh, why these patients could have a shortened period of, of efficacy on the drug. So uh, the recommendation for this uh, group of patients, so with res for responders with shortened period of efficacy, is to shorten the maintenance interval to six weeks. So not eight weeks, but six weeks, and these patients uh, uh, start um, to be doing better uh, clinically. Uh, the third group of patients that we are looking at are non-responders with production of antibodies. So this is where the problems start, because these patients uh, can have uh, hypertensive infusion reactions. Their uh, uh, trough levels of infliximab in week zero and eight are always zero. And the peak of infliximab in week two uh, is very low, and it depends on the uh, amount of antibodies that the patient uh, produces. Uh, the more antibodies the patient produces, the lower is the, is the peak of infliximab in week two, and the sooner uh, the level of the drug uh, reaches uh, zero. Um, and the, the antibodies uh, in this group of patients are responsible not only for the clinical worsening, but also for the hypertensive infusion reactions. So the recommendation for this group of patients is to uh, definitely add uh, methotrexate uh, to the therapy so that we can stop uh, production of antibodies. And we either leave the eight-week maintenance interval or we can even shorten the maintenance interval to six weeks with uh, addition of methotrexate. The shortening of the, of the maintenance interval uh, induces or simulates uh, a paradoxical immunological tolerance of the drug for the patient, so the patients are clinically doing uh, better. If this does not help, or in case of an infusion reaction, uh, we recommend to change the treatment either for a different TNF-alpha blocker, uh, we recommend a fusion protein, which is a tanercept because the antibodies are not neutralizing, and methotrexate can even be discontinued uh, with uh, a tanercept or uh, we choose a biological with a different mechanism of action, such as ustekinumab. It is questionable whether, uh, uh, when we are switching patients from infliximab to ustekinumab, whether we should still keep them on uh, methotrexate additionally. There are uh, some papers, uh, the Phoenix study, they, they, they were reporting antibodies to infliximab, but the numbers w were very low, around 4.9%. So uh, we do think that um, if a patient does not have side effects to a methotrexate, we rather keep them on methotrexate and switch them with methotrexate to uh, ustekinumab. Um, this is an example of a situation before adding a methotrexate. Uh, objectively, the number of antibodies uh, was above 160. After adding methotrexate in a dose of 12.5 milligrams uh, per week, 
uh, the antibodies dropped down to 12, and four months after keeping the same dose of methotrexate, the antibodies became negative. The last group of patients are non-responders without production of antibodies. Uh, these patients have uh, dynamics of infliximab um, completely identical to the first group, to the responders, with the difference that these patients do not respond uh, to the treatment with infliximab, and they uh, do not produce antibodies to infliximab. So for this group of patients, TNF-alpha is probably not the main cytokine in the pathogenesis of uh, psoriasis, and it is recommended to switch to a drug with a different mechanism of action, such as ustekinumab. So based on all these results, uh, we were able to elaborate uh, a summary table for uh, practical patient management. And I would just like to point out that whenever uh, you have zero levels of the drug, you are either looking at a responder with shortened period of efficacy, or you are looking at a person with production of antibodies. And usually uh, the signal for that a patient is producing antibodies is the sudden clinical uh, worsening. I thank you for your attention. Any comments? What is the uh, average dose of MTX that you that you give a patient, and for how long do you give it for? Five milligrams uh, per week and we uh, el elevate it every week uh, by 2.5, so 7.5, 10, 12.5, 15. 15 usually we stop. And you give it for three months, four months? We monitor the antibodies and w whenever we see uh, that they are negative, we start tapering down uh, methotrexate. But then we usually leave them, the patients usually continue with methotrexate. Uh, this is also a questionable th situation, we were thinking about this, whether it, uh, whether it is safe to completely uh, uh, discontinue methotrexate. I don't think so. Thanks. Uh, do you think uh, this methotrexate itself uh, is uh, effective in the control of uh, psoriasis, uh, I mean, if uh, the patients are responding to methotrexate, would you like to add infliximab then? In this case scenario, we are not adding methotrexate to have a synergistic effect with infliximab. We are adding methotrexate uh, to uh, antibody. control antibodies. This is not for therapy of psoriasis in this case. Right. But, but uh, methotrexate... Uh, Solo is, for, for is your selection criteria for uh, giving this uh, infliximab treatment uh, is uh, those patients who are not responding to methotrexate or you don't select methotrexate uh, as a treatment choice for your patients? I know what you mean. Uh, we have guidelines when we, uh, uh, when we can start biologic therapy. Uh, it has to be PASI more than one, uh, more than 10. Uh, BSA more than 10. Uh, there are guidelines and the patient uh, in my country, they have to uh, have all the systemic therapy options so that it, it was a patient who already had methotrexate, cyclosporine, uh, um, acetretine. So, they, to so they, yeah, they, these are the patients who get biologic therapy. They, they must have uh, underwent uh, the systemic therapy and then they, uh, they come to biologic therapy. I got your point. Thank you very much. In your antibody response for infliximab, is it Sorry. the antibody response in some of the patients you have antibody response for the infliximab, uh, right? We have, um, the numbers that we have are usually like 20% of patients produce antibodies. So usually every fifth patient is going to produce antibodies to infliximab. So is there any reason why the others, is or is it just questionable? Is there what? Is there a reason why other four patients are not producing the humoral response? So is there a reason for it or is it still a questionable? Um, according to the literature, uh, the, the patients who are prone, uh, who are more likely to produce uh, antibodies, maybe the patients who have, for example, positive uh, anti-nuclear antibodies before initiating uh, biologic therapy, for example, double-strand DNA uh, positive ANA, or uh, if a patient has to have um, the biologic 
therapy discontinued because of surgeries, because of infections, the risk of immunogenicity rises. Usually mm -hmm. it's safe to discontinue for 12 weeks, but after, after a certain time, um, the patient starts producing antibodies. But this is also happening uh, with adalimumab with, uh, with others. Or is it simply because it's chimeric? It's not only because this is chimeric, no. There are also uh, antibodies uh, against adalimumab, and uh, I'm also communicating with a study group from Taiwan. They are looking at the antibodies to ustekinumab, so this immunogenicity, this anti-drug antibodies are, are, are an issue. Is there any investigation for the development of humanized uh, influx, I mean, anti-TNF alpha therapy? If humanized antibodies. Is there any investigations on humanizing this mon uh, monochrome? Humanizing in uh -huh. map. Uh -huh. I don't know. Okay. So, in the past in the patients, who you added on NTX and then you measure the uh, antibody levels. What is the percentage of these patients whose antibody levels drop after the NTX was given? Was it everybody drops or? Some patients, the antibody levels drop, and some patients don't, don't drop. That means the patients got yeah. antibodies to infliximab. You add on NTX. Mm -hmm. Do you measure the antibody levels after you um, add on NTX? And do these levels uh, fall? Yeah, they usually fall. That's why I was showing you the example uh, that uh, after adding methotrexate, the number of antibodies drops. Is it for every patient or only for some Maybe patients? Maybe there can be this, uh, exceptions. Because also uh, the question is, what is an alternative for a methotrexate? You know, some patients uh, cannot uh, take methotrexate. So according to the literature, it should be uh, as a thioprene. Uh, but uh, uh, we don't have, I don't have uh, much experience regarding uh, um, reducing antibodies and uh, giving the patient as a thioprene. But this may be an alternative. This is what they use in gastroenterology for like Crohn's disease, for, for the inflammatory bowel diseases, because they have them on infliximab, and their options of how to reduce antibodies are either methotrexate or azathioprine, or even corticosteroids. They can also uh, uh, reduce uh, the number of antibodies, but only temporarily. We have been monitoring this with, uh, for example, even hydrocortisone, uh, but uh, they cannot, uh, corticosteroid cannot stop the production of antibodies, and methotrexate can. Corticosteroids can only uh, lower it for, uh, for, for some time, but, but not stop. Mm -hmm. Possibly, yes. Yes, but this is what I'm trying to say, uh, that yes, Yes, but we are doing it objectively. We know exactly when to start adding methotrexate. On the other hand, when you are not monitoring the drug levels, when you are not monitoring antibodies to infliximab, you are doing it empirically. You, know, you don't know whether the patient is going to produce antibodies. So, so I know that some, uh, some, um, some groups, they uh, start adding methotrexate uh, right away. Like, because that will, they, that will also be a question. Why don't we add methotrexate right away from week zero? Well, the answer is because we can objectively look at antibodies and we know exactly when to start adding uh, uh, methotrexate because yes, it is, uh, it is, it is, it is uh, not necessary to keep the patient double on double immunosuppression, uh, of course, yes.